What's up guys and welcome back to another episode of the Realistic Summer Career Mode. This is episode number 7 and we start today's of stuff on the back of our 3-1 loss to newly promoted Bourne for the Vitality Stadium. Three defeats in four now in all competitions for Crystal Palace sliding down the table into 14th place. We're at the EFL Cup as well. Tough beginning to the season but as I said in the last episode exactly what I want. Very realistic start here at Selhurst Park for season 1. Long may it continue. I don't want to be in the Champions League next year. I want to keep it realistic. That's how it started. So, yeah, first game uh, of today's episode on the back of a pretty poor run for Palace here. Uh, Aston Villa at Selhurst Park. Coming into the game, you would have seen as well Wilfred Zaha is returning to training after the broken toe. Thank goodness, because goals aren't really a problem for us. We, we get goals. Odds on Eduard's our top scorer. Gallagher's chipped in with uh, four this season as well. Elise's got one or two as well. You know, we, we, we get the goals. I'm not too concerned about that. But our main problem is, of course, on the defensive end. And 35 minutes in, right on QUC for our first game today. A three against Aston Villa. The former Norwich playmaker, Emmy Buendia, opens the scoring. And the Argentine gives Villa the lead. I've talked about this before and I'll say it once again. I think defending to me in FIFA 22 is at times just a really impossible task. And, you know, I always believe in taking 100% responsibility. You know, I, I really do feel as though you've, you've got to point a finger at yourself before you point it at anyone else. That leads to personal growth. But I do feel as though you have to be very, very objective when you look at things. Everyone struggles defending in this year's FIFA, and it's because the games are just so, so open, and the action-packed um, games are just, at times, a, a, a little bit too action-packed. And I think that I've mentioned this many times before, and I know I sound like a broken record, but I think for EA's sake, they need to understand that, you know, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. You know, goals are what football is all about. No one is going to deny that, but, you know, we talk about it a lot. You know, you might have one nil nil a season, and that <laughs> it's a little bit unrealistic. And I feel as though, to me, realism is becoming a really, really uh, requested thing for FIFA, especially career mode players as well, who want a more sit down and enjoy the realistic aspect of the game as opposed to ultimate team. Um, and you know, when the games routinely finish so high scoring, it does kind of take away from the immersion as well. And when I say too much of a good thing can sometimes be a bad thing. You know, I, I kind of say this based on experience. You know, if you watched my La Liga Carima, which I just finished, firstly, thank you, then you would have seen with Granada, we had like a period of games where like, I think there was about two months, two in-game months where like every game was finishing like 5-3 or 3-2 or 4-1 or something. And it was just a bit ridiculous, you know? And I do feel as though 3-8, eight, eight, they need to understand, look, goals goals are what the game is all about. Everyone accepts that. Everyone wants to see goals, you know, no doubt about it. We don't want to go back to the old days a few years ago where back in like FIFA 18, FIFA 19. I mean, I think I said before, I think that was a year back in, I think it was like FIFA 16, where I won the title with like 36 goals <laughs> scored. It was ludicrous, you know? And of course, we don't want to go back to those days, no doubt about it. But I think EA have gone too far the other direction, do you know what I mean? Like, they've gone from, you know, too many nil-nils, too many one-nils, too many poor games to just too many open games. They haven't got the right balance yet, but I'm hoping FIFA 23, they will do so. We'll see a lot more realistic gameplay, if you will, because I think that's the key nowadays. A lot of people want to see that, you know, the arcade style of FIFA, I think has kind of lost its appeal on a lot of people. I think a lot of people now just want to see more realistic games. They don't want it to be dull. They don't want it to be boring. Absolutely not. They don't want to draw nil-nil or only grind out a one-nil every game in a, you know, one hour, two hour FIFA session after work. No one, no one wants that, but I also feel as though the games at times, and, and more often than not, I should say, are just far too open, and at times that can be detrimental to your enjoyment of a FIFA session, you know? Even so, uh, after our first game was yet another loss, 2-1 to Aston Villa, a really tough run of form for Palace right now, four defeats in our last five games. We travelled to Ellen Road against Jesse Marsh's side in midweek here against Leeds United, and I, I was fearing the worst. Really poor run of form, sliding down the table, only a few points on the drop, and I had to rotate a few of my side for this game as well. I needed a response, and I needed to stop the rot. Even if I couldn't win, I needed to make sure at least I got a draw. Jack Harris 
Forest and opened the scoring for the host. We got back on level terms right before the break. Potato with his second goal of the season makes it 1 1, and we fire in the level of right before the break. And this is a really high pressure game as well. Struggling to patch a form of Crystal Palace, only just above the drop zone in terms of points right now, despite the fact we are in 14th place. I needed to stop the rot in this game because, as we know in FIFA, form is just so OP. The more games you lose in succession, the more chance you're going to have of losing the following one as well. I needed to stop the rot. I needed a result. And what a fantastic way to end and begin the first and second halves. So yeah, Matejta scores the level of right for the break. And then from kickoff in the second half, a Brecci is a first goal of the season for the former QPR man. Steps in from the left. And, well, Leeds fans will know this name. Tony Yeboah. Yeah, he used to score so many goals. Smacking him in off the underside of the crossbar. It's only fitting Eze does it here at Ellen Road, just like Yeboah used to do. Leeds 1, Crystal Palace 2. We are in front for the first time in the game. Turn the game on its head, but Leeds would get back on level terms. Yeah, 58 minutes into the game. Well, we know now he's a Barcelona player, Rafinha, on his way to the new camp. Excited to see how he gets on there. I don't actually think Barca needed him, per se. I must say, we're, we're all fascinated at what's going on right now at the new camp with the levers. I'll tell you what, I will die a happy man if I never hear the word lever ever again. But, you know, we're all fascinated what's going on at new camp right now with the levers being activated as they're trying to sell Frankie de Jong to Manchester United primarily. They've signed Rafinha. I don't think they needed him, really. Look at the options they've got. Fran Torres, Aubameyang, Antu Fati, so on. I don't think they necessarily needed Rafinha, but I am excited to see how he gets on there, and I really do think he can succeed at the new camp if he gets to consistent game time in a familiar position. He had a good season for Leeds last year. He was integral in keeping him up. He, of course, scored on the final day uh, to keep themselves up as well, so excited to see how he gets on, and I hope he does well at the new camp. He scored to make it 2-2. It seemed as though the game was going to finish all square, and again, another really open, action-packed game with our final chance of the game. Really nicely worked team goal, spreading the ball from left to right. We worked it inside, and Matata, who got the nod for this game, got his second, bags his brace, and wins it for us with a few minutes of normal time remaining. Final score, 3-2, and i got to say, I walked down that tunnel at Ellen Road so quickly, because I know I got away with this one, no doubt about it. Leeds were the better team, based on the statistics alone. It was quite an even game, though. I think it could have gone either way, really, but in the end, we just about scraped it, and Lord knows we needed it. Man, oh man. Ending November, I had to stop the rot. I would have taken a point away at Ellen Road. Tough place to go, but instead getting the win there. Back to winning ways for the first time in a few games. Man, did I need that. Absolutely delighted for our first win uh, uh, since the win against Wolves, and only out, I believe second away win of the season as well. Really needed that. So, yep, third and final game of today's episode. Travelling away to Old Trafford, though, on the weekend. Start December off. Doesn't get easier here against Eric Ten Hag's Manchester United. And obviously, as we know, there's been so many talks about where one of the greatest players of all time is going to go next. Who's that? Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah, of course. Oh, my goodness. Wow, the drama for Ronaldo. Let's just say he left it late to say he wanted to leave Old Trafford. He didn't say it at the end of the season after they finished in sixth place. No, he left it a while, to be fair to the guy. Made things a little bit more difficult for himself. But even so, he announced he wanted to leave Old Trafford. He said his time's come to an end. And I think the main reason why, if we're being totally honest here, is because... He's a little bit fearful that Messi might break his Champions League goal-scoring record. I think, I think, now I might be wrong, but I think Messi's 15 goals behind and he wants to go to a club where he knows and he feels for sure he'll be in the Champions League year after year. Next season, of course, the upcoming year, they'll be in the Europa League, Manchester United. And Ronaldo still believes, and he is good enough to still be competing in the Champions League as a starter as well, even at 37, which is mad, isn't it? But a testament to how he's kept his body and his conditioning up over all the years. Even so, the question marks were, Where's he going to go? And there were, you know, many clubs he was linked to. Paris Saint-Germain for a Messi and Ronaldo team up for the first time in football history. Oh my goodness, that would have been amazing for the memes. Um, obviously, Bayern Munich as well. Chelsea ended their interest after their signing of Sterling. Uh, I'm recording this commentary on the 15th of July. They ended the interest after the signing of Sterling, which makes total sense. I don't think Manchester United would have sold him there anyway. If they were going to sell him, it would be outside of England. I do believe that. 
Um, and also um, a couple other names which I thought were a little bit too far-fetched, such as Barcelona. No, couldn't see that happening. Of course, in their financial situation, not really realistic at all to even assume that might be a possibility. And also a return to Sporting Lisbon as well. But of course, you'd have to take a massive monster pay cut in order to return back home to Sporting Lisbon. I have to say, out of all the clubs, I'd love to know what your opinion is on Cristiano Ronaldo. I would have said, and I still believe this now, that if Lewandowski does end up going to Barcelona, it's really only Bayern Munich, at least to me. PSG have announced they're not going to get him, fair enough. To me, it's, it's only Bayern Munich, really, that makes sense. Why is that? Well, he can replace Lewandowski, whether he'll fit into the system or not. He's still more than good not to bang in the goals in the Bundesliga. He proved that in the Premier League last year. 18 goals, I think it was, for a 37-year-old. Remarkable. But even so, you know, of course, at Bayern Munich, he'd, he'd still get the goals. He'd still bang them in. You'd think they're probably going to win the Bundesliga title. It's another major European honour for Cristiano Ronaldo. And it have a shot at the Champions League as well. And playing it year after year until his retirement. The only thing is, he'd have to half his wages. Is he prepared to do that? That's the question. I think Bayern Munich at the moment seems like the only realistic fit for him if he's going to move. But I guess right now it's 50-50. Would he go there? Would Bayern take him? Would he sacrifice his salary? And also as well... Will Manchester United just say no? We're going to keep him. Eric Ten Hag wants to keep him. Will he keep him at Manchester United? I've got to say, very interesting. Let me know in the comment section down below. Do you think Cristiano Ronaldo is going to move? If you think he will, where do you think he'll go? Surely it's the Champions League football he wants, right? So surely he wouldn't go outside of Europe. But maybe you think he might go to the MLS, for example. Let me know in the comment section down below. Where do you think Ronaldo is going to go for the upcoming season? Or do you think he'll stay at Old Trafford and play in Europa League next season? Let me know in the comment section down below. Personally, I think he's staying or going to Bayern. One of the two. Have a great day, guys. Thanks for watching as always. Much love to you all, and I'll see you in the next episode of the Realistic Summer Career Mode very soon.